Well, as the country waits to see if Idaho native Sergeant Bo Bergdahl will face punishment, one man has a unique perspective on what happened to the former POW. For the first time tonight, hear from someone kidnapped by the same Taliban group that held Bergdahl. In an exclusive interview with a documentarian who is committed to telling Bo's story to help others find healing. Gone are the yellow ribbons and flag lined streets. This lone sticker, all that's left of a campaign to bring an Idaho son home. What hasn't faded here are feelings of hope and hurt, love and loss. It's a very sensitive issue here in Haley, his hometown, and it's a very political issue in America. Sean Langan has spent the last year documenting what's happened to Bo Bergdahl, a young man who loved Idaho's backcountry. I know he used to go off in these mountains, so he felt probably at home in the mountains. I've always thought that's one reason why perhaps he walked off base, because every other American soldier would be looking out thinking, I don't want to go there. But he would look at it and it reminds him of Idaho, and he probably felt it was, he could walk those mountains without coming to harm. And he paid for that mistake. Just as Sean paid for one of his own. So it's a difficult story for me to tell because, and to try and cover, because I, I went through it. For 10 years, Sean worked as a war journalist in Iraq and Afghanistan. Armed only with a camera, he fearlessly told the stories of American and British forces. His reporting took him into the heart of the fighting and even across enemy lines to talk with the Taliban. So that initial encounter was incredibly highly charged with adrenaline, and, and they tell you to go and meet some village, then you'd be blindfolded, put in the trunk of a car. And I always, the irony, I always remember thinking, this is mu what it must feel like to be kidnapped. And then you get out, they take the blindfold off, and you do an interview. This compound is now full of Taliban. Asalaamu Alaikum. Are they going to kill a goat or me? And that commander actually took pity on me. He said, look, you know, you don't want to do this too often because we took a vote on whether to kill you, kidnap you, or let you do the interview before you came down. But you'll never know which way the vote went until it's too late. So, and you know, I didn't heed that warning. In March of 2008, the Taliban invited Sean to film their training camps. He and an Afghan translator illegally crossed the Pakistan border and quickly realized it was a trap. I found myself. Uh, in a dark cell, uh, accused of being a spy by the Taliban, and, uh, and it was for the first time in my life you could feel the physical presence of death. For over three months, Sean never saw sunlight. He endured interrogations at gunpoint. Sleep came sporadically, awaking to real-life nightmares of his kidnappers holding a knife to his throat. Sean's strength came from peeking at the photographs of his young sons he kept hidden in his boots. That was the little bit of innocence and purity in that dark hellhole I, I was able to <clears throat> protect. Which is why when his kidnappers demanded to know the names of his children, Sean refused until they threatened to shoot his interpreter. For the first time in captivity, Sean cried. He says the psychopath commander took advantage of his weak moment. And he, he pretended to have a crocodile. He said, I understand the pain of a father. We, we understand the innocence of childhood. And, and he showed me a video, and it was a, a little boy, about 10, in a lovely white swell kameez. And I said, is that your son? He said, no, no, watch. And then the camera pulls away, and I realized this child's got a belt, a suicide bomb. And the next shot is this child walking towards a US Humvee and blowing it up. And then he says, you see? We also understand the loss of childhood. And that's when I realized, you know, I mean, I was never under any illusions about the Taliban, but I realized it would be some miracle if I get out of here alive. Back in England, Sean's family and television company finally negotiated his release with what Sean guesses is about a $200,000 ransom. 14 pounds and five teeth lighter. The journalist suffered one final torture. So I spent two days watching people being beheaded and shot in the head as a parting gift. The documentarian would never return to the Middle East. What's your name? My name is Bo Bergdahl. One year later, those same terrorists captured another man 
Sergeant Bo Berkdahl. Do you think it was similar, what you experienced and what Bo experienced? I suspect it was even harder for him, and after years, you lose hope. Wanting to help bring Bo home, Sean reached out to the Bergdahls early last year. They agreed to interview with him, but then the story changed. Sergeant Bergdahl has missed birthdays and holidays and the simple moments with family and friends, which all of us take for granted. But while Bo was gone, he was never forgotten. Public opinion quickly turned, and many now called the POW a traitor. Rather like he was a bargaining chip when he's in captivity is now political football. Sean has seen and heard it all as he's lived and worked on the documentary in Haley. So there are people in town who have talked to Bo. Yeah, and seen him. But they think he may never come home. Bob and Jannie Bergdahl have yet to do a formal interview, but did speak briefly with Sean. Has she talked to Bo? Yeah, they're in contact. But Bo's on the base in uh, uh, Texas. Have they seen him? I don't know. She didn't want to talk to me too much about uh, but uh, her suffering was palpable. Sean understands all too well the Bergdahl's despair, but it doesn't surprise him. Bo has not seen his parents. Sean didn't speak to his own brother for over a year after captivity. Strange things happen to you when you've been captured and you have PTSD. For a long time, Sean slept on the floor with a light always on. Even now, the trauma he lived through can still haunt him. It's ironic that it took me five years, and I've come to Haley to make a documentary about an American prisoner of war, and, and this has been far more valuable than any counseling sessions I did back in London, and uh, it's really a part of my healing process. He considers this community a second home and hopes in time its residents find healing and perspective, as he has with his own past. It was the greatest lesson in life. But if anyone wanted to give it to me again, I, I would literally shoot them and failing that, shoot myself. So you don't want to go through it again. <clears throat> but I don't regret it, bizarrely. As for how his documentary on Bo Bergdahl ends, not even the man behind the camera can guess. Bergdahl is charged with desertion and misbehavior before the enemy. He is scheduled to be in military court in Texas in July. And if convicted, Bergdahl could face up to life in prison. Hmm, so really... Maybe no one has the kind of perspective that Sean has about what Bergdahl went through, but he doesn't necessarily think that Bergdahl should get completely off in no. all of this. No, in fact, he's been doing plenty of research. He spent time in Haley, he's talked to him, been in Washington, D.C., talked with insiders there, been in Texas. And what he told me is that his research shows that Bo is most likely a deserter and should be punished for that. But I found this interesting. He also told me that he strikes him as, quote, not the American way if a POW ends up back behind bars. So he'll mm. be watching, we'll be watching, and it'll be interesting to see how the documentary finally turns out and when it turns out. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see that. Also, I think there's a lot of people who may question the sanity of an individual going into a place like that to deal directly with the Taliban, but by the same token, we wouldn't have his experience without that. True, and we need war journalists who would do that when you and I sit in lovely Boise, Idaho.